stage here at the Corning Museum of Glass. You've joined us for one of our special engagements. This is our How They Do That show. And for this show, we choose a piece that you may have seen in the museum today and show you how they do that. Dane is our glass artist for this demonstration. He gets things started by collecting clear molten solid line glass from the melting furnace. That clear glass appears orange or yellow and oozes over 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. At that temperature, the material glows or radiates its own light, resulting in that orange look. Now Dane's adding some color. He's using some cobalt blue. It's a beautiful transparent blue glass. The heat radiating off the clear warms up the tiny crushed pieces of colored glass and they stick and fuse right to the surface. We then have a whole bunch of three-dimensional texture. We go to a heat source, our reheating furnace here, to melt in that layer of color. Now, depending on the different colors you use, you may need more than one coat, but cobalt blue is a really good, strong color, so one coat of color is actually plenty to make a good sized vessel. Whenever the glass is warmed up, though, you're not going to see the true color. You will see a brilliant orange glow. As Dane shapes the glass, he's also cooling it. You notice that that glow left the glass very quickly as he began to shape it. Once this is centered up, he'll blow into the end of the hollow stainless steel tube or blowpipe to create our starter bubble. He'll place his thumb over the mouthpiece and trap the air inside, causing it to build up pressure as it's drawn to the high heat of the glass. Takes it just a second or two, but you saw that glass increase in size. Now we can't see the bubble because of the color layer, but we know that we have an air bubble in the glass because we can obviously see that it got a little bit bigger, but also because of Dane's years of experience and practice. Now, the second that he wants that air bubble to stop inflating because the air trapped inside that glass is being heated, so it could continuously expand. He just takes his thumb off the mouthpiece of the blowpipe here and escape out the end of the blowpipe and the inflation stops. We're now going to wait for our starter bubble to cool down. As glass cools from that fluid molten state at 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, it sets up and becomes more rigid. Our glass is actually considered cold at roughly about 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. We consider that glass to be cold because it's as rigid as the glass is going to become. So Dane waits for us uh, to have our starter bubble close to that temperature point so that it can support the weight and the heat of a new gathered glass. Inside our melting furnace, we have a potter or crucible. We plunge the starter bubble below the molten surface, rotating smoothly and evenly and collecting out an additional gathered glass. Our new fluid molten layer is glowing bright orange. The glass stays on the end of the iron because of the constant rotation you're watching Dane keep up through the entire process. If you were to stop turning, the glass would drip towards the floor just like honey would if you coiled it out of the jar on a honey dipper and then held it still. It would fall right towards the floor. So you'll see that constant rotation through the entire process. Once again, he shapes and pulls the new molten layer. The core bubble on the inside is now wrapped in 2,000 degree glass, so it starts to absorb that heat. Once the temperature is even throughout the glass, it will move all at the same rate. So that's why we let our starter bubble get very cold before we gather over it, because it needs to basically not heat up so fast and stay stable so that Dane can collect the glass nice and evenly and make his way back over the working bench. Now as soon as the temperature is even, we can begin to inflate the glass and get a nice even expansion. Sometimes you can move right along into that with just the heat from the, the melting furnace, but a lot of artists will go back for just a few seconds in that reheating chamber to really make sure that heat is nice and even. If we have an uneven temperature in our uh, bubble here, we're going to get uneven expansion. The breath of air that you blow into the pipe is always going to take the path of least resistance, which is the hottest and therefore softest glass. All these different hand tools that we work with take a different amount of temperature from the glass. So Dana will use the red tool for the job depending on what step he's at. But he'll pull the nose of the bubble, blow into the blowpipe, the side walls will expand, the top portion of the piece closest to him, that will be the shoulders of the piece. These tools here are called jacks, and he's working in a constriction line right off the end of the blowpipe. That constriction line is later on not only going to be the lip of our finished form, but first it will serve as our breakout point for the piece. Every piece that we make, whether it is a blown traditional vessel or a solid sculpture of a dinosaur, we need a way to break it free from that original iron. That constriction line is a structural weakness in the glass. We're actually going to break the glass to separate it from the pipe, but the crack that we create is going to travel and wrap right around that line. So it's 
a little bit like the creases in a chocolate bar. It's just the weak points where it's going to break free the easiest. On top of the structure of the glass, helping us to break it free nice and easy, we're also going to use thermal shock. This material is fluid and molten at 2,000 degrees. As, it's as rigid as it will ever become at roughly about 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's also vulnerable to thermal shock. The glass can cool from its molten state to 1,000 degrees very quickly. That's just fine. But if it cools from 1,000 degrees and below too fast, the material experiences thermal stress and it will start to crack and break. So we're going to take advantage of that later on to break the piece free from the pipe. Here, Dane takes advantage of gravity to stretch that round shape into more of a cylinder, just by pointing the glass ever so slightly towards the floor. Every move that Dane makes is going to affect the glass, that constant rotation of the iron. We have to become a little bit like human legs and keep a nice, precise turn to keep the shape nice and even through the entire process. So if there's a little bit of a hiccup in that turn, it translates in the glass. You would see the glass kind of have a little hiccup as well. Imagine a car with three good tires and one flat one, a little bit of a the thump, the thump, the thump as you turn the iron. So you've got to work on that to keep that nice and even, make the shape uh, as symmetrical as you'd like it to be. So Dane's never going to stop turning. Um, we joke around that if you can hand a glass blower a pull cue or a broomstick, that they're immediately going to start turning it. It works with a pencil too, or try it. It's second nature to us. After years and years of practice, he doesn't think too much about that turn as he's working. He's focused more on the shape he's got going there and the hand tools that he's working on. Now he can control how the glass moves by how he heats it and also where he heats it. Uh, at this stage, it seems he's still pretty much heating the entire form. So the color matches all the way through until, of course, he starts to pull it with our various hand tools. But for other steps in the process, he'll focus the heat just where he wants to change the shape. Uh, blue is a great color for demonstration, so you'll be able to see that very easily. Now for the particular piece that we're making, which I've failed to mention so far, doing, doing my job real well, we're going to be making this lily pad stitcher. So Dana started up sort of the body, set up the body of the form. We're going to start adding some of the bits that make this piece what it is. The first bit is actually going to be, uh, it's going to look a little bit like a splash on the bottom of the picture. But I know I need a significant amount of glass for both of the two bits that we're going to be adding next. Dane said I should probably gather two times to make sure that I've got the right amount of material. It's always better if I gather a little bit too much material, Dane can just use the amount he needs for the piece. So this will show you what happens to the glass what, as soon as we stop turning. Gravity affects the material, it pulls right off the iron. Dane can cut through the material at that hot temperature. Remember, the hotter the glass, the more fluid, also the softer the glass. So we can cut right through it at that high temperature. He quickly centers the glass and then he'll grab hold of the glass and begin to pull it up onto the bottom. Now this is creating a lot of three-dimensional texture. This is the uh, the bottom half of the picture. You might be able to see it. Hopefully everybody can see our picture up here on the stage. But you can see why it looks a little bit like a splash as Dane continues to work the glass. Now at this point, that fresh bit that was brilliant orange, you can already see, it's just gone to clear. The heat has left the material, it's now frozen into place. Now Dane has created a lot of texture, but he's not going to keep it. He's actually going to use all that material at the far, far end of that bubble to create the round section in the bottom of the pitcher. So when Dane was inflating that bubble to begin with, he took a little bit of extra time to make sure the nose of the bubble, the part furthest away from him, was a little bit colder. He did that with various hand tools. But this ensured that that glass traveled a little bit slower and therefore remained a little bit thicker as he inflated the entire form. So this leaves him uh, a thickness at the bottom of the form to ensure that it's nice and sturdy. But it's also going to leave him more or less room to grow. He'll be able to stretch and inflate that glass because he set the bubble up that way so that he would have that excess material to inflate into later on. 
can still see a little bit of that brilliant glow when Dean blows into the blowpipe, only the glass that's warm enough is going to expand. This tool here is a graphite paddle, and graphite actually almost rips the heat right out of the glass. So, so that's helping Dean to keep the shape. It's also cooling that very end of the bubble. Now when he goes over to take a reheat, the first part of the piece into that furnace and the last part out is the part of the vessel that we want to essentially be the coldest, the very, very bottom. So that's why we take the steps to cool that down a little bit right before we take that reheat. Glass has a little bit of a memory, meaning wherever we've chilled the glass, when we heat the entire form up, that section is a little bit colder, it's a little bit behind. So it won't heat up as fast as the rest of the piece. That can ensure that thick base for the bottom of our kitchen. So Dean's really started to inflate the glass at this point. The next bit we'll be adding will be to create the base of our vessel. Now, if Dean was responsible for this design, he could choose to just reach up with one of our hands and flatten the end of his bubble. But because we are making a specific form our lily pad pitcher, the design sort of already picked out for Dean. But we'll add another solid mass of material to the bottom and sculpt out of her. Looks like Dean wants room for a little bit more uh, lemonade or iced tea. It is pretty warm out here. So he's going for an additional heat. We'll make this shape a little bit larger just at the base. You notice that he only heats the very bottom of the form in that reheating furnace to keep control over that expansion. These tools here are actually wooden tools. They're not soaked in water, but we will quench them if they do start to smoke a little bit on us. But the wooden tool takes the least amount of heat from the glass, and therefore gives us a little bit longer of a working time. And it also won't leave behind any scratch marks on our piece as well. Now Dane is the lead artist on the team, so he's not only responsible for most of the work, but he's also running the team, so he let me know that it was time to start gathering up for the base of this piece. Again, I'm going to gather twice to make sure I have a significant amount of material. I take a small gather and wait a little bit outside of the furnace so that that cools down a little bit and solidifies so that I can gather over it, just like Dean did with the starter bubble at the very beginning of the process. along 
that line, further weakening the glass, a drop of water, a light tap, the piece breaks free, the crack travels right around that line, right where we wanted it. I immediately begin turning. I want to keep things running nice and on center for Dane.
taking that little sort of fly away, if you will, and touching it down to uh, the edge of the vessel. Now, that would not be a permanent connection at all. It cooled down pretty significantly. So Dana laid it onto the neck of the pitcher and then went over for a reheat. He would have done this anyway to make sure the whole wrap was fully fused into this representative piece. But that little piece that was lifted off the vessel at the end, he just laid it on there so it's barely fused. So he's really going to make sure that he has enough heat uh, to warm in that little last part of the bit. Did you need something else? All right, just a tapered cylinder. All right, so you'll want to keep your eyes on Dane. He's going to work on the core stop for our pitcher. While he's doing that, I'm going to set up the handle. There's all different types of handles. You uh, heard me ask Dane if you just wanted a tapered cylinder. There's textured handles. There's so many different kinds. If you've been in the collections yet today, I'm sure you've seen quite a few different handles. Edges from the breakaway and then place it away. 